So I'm absolutely delighted today to introduce to you Sonia Punch Punchkov. Yeah, uh, Sonia Punchkov, and she's from Melbourne, University of Melbourne. It is uh, 4 a.m. in Melbourne. So my goodness, Sonia, it's amazing to have you here. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And you got such an exciting topic today, all about supernova remnants. Of course, we know the Crab Nebula. I mean, most of us mm -hmm. have that. But anyway, welcome. And, um, and uh, we're excited to hear your webinar today. I'm very happy um, to be presenting for you all. So I guess as Christian mentioned, um, today I'll be talking about uh, supernova remnants. Um, and I've titled my talk, um, The Fingerprints of Stellar Death. And I guess the reason why is that when we look at dead stars, we can kind of piece together all these little bits of information um, that kind of add up to tell us uh, exactly um, how the star died. So kind of um, forensic information that we can piece together to understand uh, the full story. Um, so as, I as Christian mentioned, my name's Sonia. Um, I work at the University of Melbourne. Um, and yeah, and so that'll be the topic for today's talk. So um, really when we're thinking about stellar evolution, um, the way a star is gonna die is pretty much to a large degree determined as soon as it's born. Um, and so these stars, they're born from stellar nurseries, uh, something that might look like this, really a big cloud of gas and dust um, that can condense down and collapse to form a star or multiple stars. Um, and it's at this point that we do determine kind of the ultimate fate of our stars, um, depending on their initial mass. And so there's kind of one tra trajectory they can go down, um, and that's the life of a low mass star, um, which has a mass of less than roughly eight times the mass of the sun. Um, and then the other option is a massive star. And so these are stars with masses, great, with masses greater than eight times the mass of the sun. Um, and so we'll go into depth about how these kind of um, lifetimes evolve down these different paths. So we'll start with the massive stars and the phrase that astronomers or stellar astrophysicists like to throw around all the time is that uh, massive stars live fast and die young. And that's really because these stars, they're so massive that in their cores where fusion is occurring and um, energy is being produced to maintain the star, there are really high temperatures and pressures and densities that allow the fusion to proceed very quickly. And so they manage to burn through their fuel like very fast, um, you know, on the order of, you know, maybe a hundred billion years at most. Um, and so that's really fast on an astronomical scale because we'll see a bit later that um, low mass stars can live for billions of years. And so once one of these massive stars has condensed out of a stellar nursery, um, what happens is fusion begins in the core. So we're fusing hydrogen into helium to produce energy and that's kind of counteracting the inwards force of gravity and maintaining our star. Um, but at some point you run out of that hydrogen in the core um, and so what happens is the energy source is removed and the core begins to collapse a little bit and becomes a bit hotter and denser. Um, and this allows um, helium burning to set in. Um, and this is a new form of energy. But in this process, what we see is that the star, the temperature in the core increases and this causes the outer layers to kind of puff up and expand and cool down. And so this is where we get a red supergiant. So the radius becomes a lot larger and the color uh, and the temperature becomes lower. And so it becomes a redder object. Um, and so that's when helium fusion sets in. But because massive stars are so big, the fusion doesn't stop there. So once helium is exhausted, um, carbon burning can set in. Um, and then different kind of levels and stages of um, fusion take place all the way up until iron. Um, and so this is the heaviest element that we're able to fuse in stars um, because once you try and start fusing heavier elements, you actually need to input energy. Um, and that's when we're talking about fission and that's what's happening in nuclear reactors. Whereas in stars, fusion's occurring and so we're kind of limited um, at um, producing iron. And so once we have fused all of the material and we've produced iron, there's no more energy that can be produced from fusion um, and so what happens is once you cut off your energy source, 
very rapidly within a second, your core collapses because it can't maintain itself against that inwards gravity of the star. Um, and this is the event that we refer to as a core collapse supernova. So the core quite suddenly collapses down um, and this generates an outwards expanding shock wave um, that creates many different types of elements and a very, um, very bright astrophysical event that we know as a supernova. And so a supernova really is the death of a star. And when we're talking about those massive stars, um, it's a core collapse supernova. And then the other really important um, thing to know with core collapse supernova, supernovae, is that we see the formation of these uh, ultra dense objects that you've probably heard of, um, one being a neutron star um, and the other being a black hole. Um, and so these are actually the leftover stellar remnants of that ultra dense core where fusion was occurring. Um, and the difference is for a neutron star, the star was maybe not quite so big that you were able to condense the material all the way down to a black hole. Um, so in a neutron star, it is a type of star, but there's actually no fusion occurring. And so it's maintained in a somewhat different way. Um, and it's this quantum mechanical principle that kind of requires neutrons to be repelled from each other. And so this repulsion is what allows the star to maintain its shape. Um, but yeah, these are formed of neutrons and they're ultra dense. I think there's some statistic that's like a tablespoon of a neutron star on Earth would be the same size as Mount Everest. So they're very, very dense um, and they're not that big. So most I think have radii or around 20 kilometers or, or so. So very dense, but comparatively quite small. And then if your star is massive enough and your collapse condenses the core even further, we can see the formation of a black hole. So this is something that is so dense that its gravitational field um, is too strong even for gravity and not even light to escape. Um, and so when we think about core collapse supernova, we see that bright light curve where the star becomes very bright as it's dying. And then if we look in the center for some of our supernova remnants, we can sometimes see emission from these, what we call compact objects. And so that's kind of how massive stars tend to live their lives. Um, but what about the low mass stars? Well, they also begin their lives um, using helium in the core, uh, hydrogen in the core, sorry. Um, it proceeds at a, at a slower rate because they're not as big and so the temperatures and pressures aren't as big, but they're fusing their hydrogen. Um, and then at some point your hydrogen runs out just like with massive stars, um, the core um, condenses and heats up, which kind of pushes out your outer layers again, um, which increases the radius of your star um, and lowers its temperature as it expands. So we would get a red giant. So very similar to a red supergiant with those massive stars. Um, they're just a little bit smaller because we have less matter to work with. Um, and so that's kind of the next step. However, unfortunately for low mass stars, they can um, use high, uh, helium together, but then beyond that, their masses are not great enough. And so it's really a helium fusion in the core that um, things become quite different for these stars. And so eventually your power source is cut off, fusion ceases, um, and your star begins to swell up. So the core is contracting and becoming hotter, um, and the outer layers are becoming cooler and expanding. And eventually this leads to the outer layers no longer being kind of gravitationally bound to your star. And so they're kind of pushed off and they form what um, we refer to as a planetary nebula. So I've included this image here. This is actually one of the first JWST uh, images that was released last year. It's the Southern Ring Nebula. Um, so this is a planetary nebula and it actually has nothing to do with planets. It's really um, kind of the remains of a low mass star. Um, and they're really quite beautiful. So clouds of gas and dust. Um, and what is special about these ones? Well, at the center, we also have a dense compact object, but this one is called a white dwarf. Um, and so these are um, very dense objects. And just like with a neutron star, they're repelled or they're maintained not by fusion, but by um, a quantum mechanical principle called the Pauli exclusion principle, which says that your electrons aren't able to get so close together because they need to have different quantum mechanical states. Um, and so that's what maintains this star, um, the electron de degeneracy pressure and not fusion. 
Um, so they're really quite interesting. Um, they're very small and they're found at the hearts of these planetary nebula. Um, and then in theory, we theorize that these white dwarfs should eventually um, cool down to become a black dwarf um, just by radiating off the heat that was left from the star that they were born from. However, this process is theorized to take longer than the age of the universe. So we've actually never seen a black dwarf, um, but that should really be the final state of a low mass star, but we'll have to wait, you know, a few more billion years probably to maybe detect one. Um, yeah, and so then you might be asking, well, what about type 1a supernovae? So these, low, these high mass stars create core collapse supernovae, and then you've heard of type 1a, so where do they come, where do they come in? Because we haven't talked about them yet. Well, um, these white dwarfs are the, actually the precursors to type 1a supernovae, and due to this um, Pauli um, degeneracy pressure that maintains the white dwarf, they actually have a maximum mass. Um, and so this is referred to as the Chandrasekhar mass, and it's roughly 1.44 times the mass of the sun. And so if your white dwarf manages, manages to pair up and find um, a companion, so another regular star, so a high mass or a low mass star, or even another white dwarf and it manages to gain material. Well, um, if that material brings its mass to more than the Chandrasekhar mass, um, this triggers a runaway thermonuclear explosion. So similar to what we see um, with um, atomic bombs or hydrogen bombs, um, that runaway thermonuclear explosion is what we refer to, uh, refer to as a type 1a supernova. So um, that's kind of the other option. So when we're talking about supernovae, there are two main classes that, at least for me, we're interested in. There are definitely subclasses. Um, but when we're thinking about supernova remnants, um, yeah, we're thinking about core collapse, which come from those high mass stars, um, and type 1a supernovae that come from the low mass stars if they find a companion to gain material from. So they're the supernovae that we're thinking about. And then I thought I would just include some supernova facts to impress your friends, because they're really quite impressive um, astronomical events. Um, and I guess the first one is many he heavy elements. So pretty much most things that are heavier than iron, um, including uranium and gold, which we love to use here on Earth, are formed during these events. Um, and you might've heard the Carl Sagan quote, which says something about how we're all star stuff. And that's really because these, um, these events are just producing so many different elements, right? And as well, we have the production of lower mass elements from stars. So these are really kind of the chemical warehouses um, of the universe. Um, and then they're actually quite common, these events. So across the whole universe, we're seeing one per second. So that's quite a lot. Um, However, in the Milky Way, which is, of course, much smaller than the universe, we're seeing roughly two per century. Um, we haven't seen one in a while. Um, however, this is, uh, doesn't mean they're not happening. The problem is the center of the Milky Way is really dense and it's quite hard to see through. Um, and so it's possible that our two per century have happened on the other side and we just haven't been able to observe them. Um, and then they're ultra bright uh, events and highly energetic and they can outshine even the galaxy that these um, stars are located in, which is very, very impressive. Um, and as well, yeah, very energetic. So they're releasing roughly 10 to the 44 joules of energy, um, which is um, over 10 to the 28 times more energetic than the first atomic bomb, the little boy. Um, so they're very impressive events. And then, so today we're talking about supernova remnants. So what are they? Well, they're clouds of dust and gas um, that remain following one of these events. So either a core collapse or a type 1a supernova. Um, and they're special for a lot of reasons. And one of these reasons is that we see emission um, across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and so this is from low energy radio waves um, down this end of the spectrum with uh, long wave long wavelengths and low frequencies, um, all the way up to visible light, so what we, you and I can see every day with our eyes, 
Um, and then we also see very high energy emissions. So from X-rays with very short frequencies and all the way up to gamma rays. And so they're really emitting across the entire um, electromagnetic uh, spectrum. And this is due to a whole lot of different processes that are occurring. Um, and what also is important is that they're visible for up to 100,000 years. Um, and this is really important for some of the observing kind of constraints that we do. But I'll get into that a little bit later on. And you might be asking, well, why study supernova remnants? And I think the most important reason and the reason that um, I picked my PhD topic is that they're beautiful. So they're really, really nice to look at. And I've got some examples on this slide. Um, so as Christian mentioned at the beginning, we have the Crab Nebula, which I think is maybe the most famous astronomical image. It just pops up all the time. Even people not studying supernova remnants will put this in their talk. So um, yeah, this is a galactic remnant from a, a high mass star and it's really very beautiful. Um, we also have supernova 1987A, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. So this is actually the most recent um, supernova that we've occurred, the closest one and the most recent. So it wasn't in the galaxy, it was actually in the large Magellanic cloud. Um, so we haven't seen one in the galaxy for a few centuries, but yeah, we saw this one in 1987 and it was really important for a lot of different reasons. Um, one of them being that it was the first time that we managed to detect um, neutrinos from a supernova. Um, so very, very light particles that travel close to the speed of light and were theorized to be produced um, in core collapse supernovae. Um, and we were able to detect these and we detected these actually before we even saw the, vis the visible light or the electromagnetic light from the supernova. And that's because these neutrinos don't interact with much. So they're actually able to escape through the star before the light is. And so we detected some neutrinos on Earth um, and then we were told, oh, look at this part of the sky. And then a few hours later, we managed to see the supernova. And so we've been watching that um, star die basically in real time since 1987. And be we've been able to see exactly how things have kind of proceeded. Um, and then we also have here, Pico's remnant, um, which is a historic supernovae. And so there are people that kind of study kind of more of the historical aspects of supernovae because a lot of them have been documented um, by different cultures throughout time. And so this one is named after Tycho Brahe, the Danish astronomer, and it occurred in 1572 um, because a star suddenly became much, much brighter than it originally was. So he was interested in that. Um, and then, um, you know, centuries later, we had amazing telescopes and we found this supernova remnant in the sky and they were able to align the dates and the positions and work out that this was the one that um, Tycho Brahe had documented. But there are stories and um, documentations of uh, different supernovae by many cultures like the Chinese people or as well um, the first Australians in Australia. So yeah, they've been occurring for centuries. And so they're beautiful and we have many of them. Um, and why else? Well, they can help us understand how stars die. So even though we might not have seen the supernova itself with the telescope with the, uh, and watched how the light curve and the light emission has evolved, we can still look back and we can see the leftover parts and piece together those pieces of information to come to kind of an understanding of how that star died and what it might have been like before it died. Um, and then thirdly, they live for a long time, so we can study entire populations. So as I said, we can see them for up to 100,000 years after the supernovae. Um, sometimes, not all the time, it depends on kind of the environment that they're in, but we can see them for a long time. Um, and so what this allows us to do is that we can look at you know, a certain galaxy and see all of the supernova remnants that have occurred in the last 100,000 years or so. So we can look at that entire population and try and study how certain properties of those remnants kind of vary amongst that population, um, which can be a really good way to kind of understand how those stars die. And then, so that's why supernova rem remnants, but um, which ones do I look at and do most people look at? Well, we've got three main populations. So we have um, the galactic supernova remnants. So um, the ones in the Milky Way, which is of course our home. 
and there's roughly 300 of these. Um, and so I've got this uh, image here. So this is from the Meerkat radio telescope in South Africa. And you can see kind of these blobby structures kind of all over the place. And they're um, all supernova remnants. So there really are lots of them. Um, and they're pretty close to us. So that's a really good way to, um, to see um, them in really high resolution. So we get really good images. However, the problem is for a lot of them, we've got the center of a galaxy, which has lots of emission from other processes taking place. There's lots of dust and there's lots of things in the way that can kind of block up you. And so for that reason, sometimes it's not always good um, to study galactic remnants. And so then we have um, two other populations that are super, super useful. Um, and these are the populations in the small, Mag and, the small and the large Magellanic clouds. Um, so in the small Magellanic cloud, the FNC, we have roughly 30 remnants. Um, and then in the large Magellanic cloud, we have roughly 70 remnants. Um, and if you're lucky enough to be located in um, the Southern hemisphere, you can actually see these by eye. Um, and so if you go outside and you find your band of the Milky Way, and then you look underneath it, you'll see a bigger blob and then a smaller blob, and they are the Magellanic clouds. So that's very cool. So if you manage to go to a dark place and look up, you should be able to see those by eye, which is very, very cool. So there are populations. And then I guess a bit more in depth about the small and uh, large Magellanic clouds. Well, they're not actually clouds. They're irregular dwarf galaxies. And what does that mean? Well, um, they're galaxies, they're small, and they're irregular. So I've got some images here of the small Magellanic cloud and the large Magellanic cloud um, with the markers kind of indicating the location of those remnants. Um, but you can see they're really quite blobby. So they're not like a spiral structure and they're not an elliptical galaxy. They're just kind of blobby clouds of stars and gas and dust and all of this stuff. Um, and so there are galactic neighbors and they're located very close to the Milky Way. Um, so at 61 kiloparsecs for the small Magellanic cloud, and then 50 kiloparsecs for the large Magellanic cloud, which is very close um, on astronomical scales, but just note that one parsec is 200,000 times the distance from the sun to the earth. So, you know, these are very, very far away, but close, close in terms of the whole universe, I guess. Um, and they're really perfect environments for studying supernova remnants. And this is for three main reasons. So firstly, they're nearby. So um, we can use our telescopes and we can get, you know, a pretty good view of these objects with good resolution and good depth um, of our remnants, uh, which makes for good statistics when we're analyzing them. Uh, we also have a very good view. So as I said, with the Milky Way, there can be stuff blocking our view of the remnants and we get quite a big background. Um, for the Magellanic Clouds, they're located at a location where we have pretty much a clear line of sight. So we don't have to worry too much about what's in between. Um, and then what else is really important is that we know how far away all the remnants are. So um, both the small and the large Magellanic Clouds are oriented face on to us. So if you imagine a dinner plate or something like this, we're looking at it from the, the front. And so that means that all of our remnants are basically at the same distance. Um, and that's really important because one thing that's um, really key to understanding supernova remnants is how big they are. And in order to know how big something is, um, we need to know how far away it is. And so for these ones, we get a really good constraint on the distance and hence their like diameter or radius. Whereas for the galactic uh, remnants, it's actually harder to work out how far away they are. Um, and so there's actually higher uncertainties in their, um, in their sizes. And so these are the kind of the reasons why we look at the Magellanic clouds um, a lot of the time when we're studying supernova remnants. And then, as I said, uh, supernova remnants, they emit across basically the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Um, but the research that I do with my supervisor here at the University of Melbourne, we tend to focus uh, on the X-ray emission, um, sometimes also a little bit the radio, but mainly the X-rays. Um, and I guess, why do we see X-ray emission in supernova remnants? Because basically all of the different um, wavelengths of emission 
uh, related to different kind of physical processes. Well, for X-rays, um, we have that expanding supernova shockwave. Um, and what that does is it heats up our ejector, so our leftover kind of stellar material. And when you heat a gas to really, really high temperatures, you actually see the emission of X-rays. Um, and so that's why we can observe these uh, objects in X-rays. Um, but more importantly, the X-rays give us a lot of really valuable information. And so depending on the, the composition of that ejector, we actually see emission at kind of different energies, um, depending on the elements that are present. And so this is because of the structure of the atoms, which is kind of, you know, already determined that it's not going to change. And so if we see a certain um, transition, each element has specific energies that are associated with them. So I've got like an example X-ray spectrum here. Um, this one was captured with XMM Newton. And so on our X-axis, we have energy um, in killer electron volts. Um, so that's just another unit for energy, but basically low energy down this end and high energy up this end. Um, and then on this uh, axis, axis, we have counts per second per killer electron volts. So it's really telling us um, how intense the emission is uh, at that uh, energy. And so we have what we call a continuum. And so that's like kind of the main shape of this spectrum. Um, and that's due to different processes of accelerating electrons um, in different magnetic fields and stuff like this. Um, and then on top, we have what we call emission lines. And so these are the bumps that sit on top of that main shape. And they're associated with specific elements depending on the structure of that element. And so if we know uh, what energies to expect, and we see an emission line, we can say, oh, that one is from iron, because we know iron has an emission at roughly 6.3 6, um, 6 kilo electron volts. And so we can work out what elements are present in our ejector, and that can really tell us a lot about um, the star that left our remnant behind. And so that's why um, X-ray emission from supernova remnants is really important. And how can we see X-rays? Well. Um, for my research, I use the Chandra X-ray Observatory, which some of you might have heard of. So this is a uh, space telescope that observes um, in X-rays from roughly 0.2 kilo electron volts all the way up to 10. And it was launched on the Space Shuttle Columbia in 1999. So it's been observing um, from space for up to 20, yeah, for almost 20 years, probably a bit more. Um, and it orbits at an altitude of roughly 139,000 kilometers um, and looks at you know, a whole range of objects from supernova remnants uh, to galaxy clusters um, and as well accreting black holes, including the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Um, so it provides really stunning images at X-ray wavelengths. Um, and yeah, I think is probably the best, the best tool that we have currently for seeing X-rays. Um, and the reason as well um, that it's located in space is because um, on Earth, right, we've got our atmosphere that protects us from X-rays. So if we were to use a ground-based telescope, we'd actually see nothing. So that's why if we're trying to see X-rays or gamma rays, we pretty much always have to be using a space telescope. Okay, so we're seeing X-rays and we're thinking about the two kind of types of supernovae and their remnants. Well. How do these remnants differ? So remember that type 1a remnants come from low mass stars and core collapse remnants come from high mass stars. Um, well, there are, because of the different ways these stars live their lives and end their lives, we see different properties in the remnants. Um, and so one of these is the location that we usually find them in. So type 1a remnants, these are generally found um, in sparse environments, so places where there's not as much happening. Um, while core collapse remnants we tend to see in very dense star forming environments. Um, and this is because massive stars tend to form out of giant molecular clouds and they're located together and then living their lives together and supernovae are going off. So there's lots happening in those parts of space. Um, as well, type 1a remnants tend to be more symmetric uh, while core collapse remnants tend to be less symmetric. Um, and we'll kind of delve a bit more into that later on. Um, and then if we're thinking about our X-ray spectra, well, in type 1A remnants, we tend to see um, more iron and nickel. Um, and so bumps at 
higher energies from these elements. Um, whereas poor collapsed supernovae in their X-ray spectra, we see emission from sulfur and neon and silicon. So relatively more from the lower mass kind of elements. And so those are the main differences um, between the two types of supernova remnants. And then, as I said, um, asymmetry is something that kind of varies between the two groups. Um, and what do I mean by asymmetry? Well, I've got this plot here that I've included from a, a publication in 2009 by Laura Lopez and her research group at the Ohio State University. Um, and so what we've got on the x-axis, um, we've got increasing asymmetry. Um, and then on the y-axis, we have increasing ellipticity. So increasing asymmetry, can you fold the remnant in half and will it resemble itself? So mirror asymmetry or mirror symmetry. Um, and then ellipticity, is it round, is it circular, or is it more kind of um, oblate and elliptical? And so what um, Laura and her group did was they took a sample of supernova remnants that had known classifications from other means. So usually by looking at their X-ray spectrum um, and looking for iron and nickel from the type 1A remnants or lower mass elements in the core collapse remnants. And then for these remnants that had already known classification, they kind of analyze their morphology, so their shape. And using a technique called the power ratio method, which I won't go into at the moment because the maths is not so nice and not something I want to talk about at four in the morning, but um, you can quantify the shapes of these objects, so mathematically, and you can get a value for how asymmetric the remnant is and also how elliptical it is. And so on this plot, we've got our type 1A remnants. So these are down in the bottom left hand. Um, and that's kind of the region of the plot where things are less elliptical and less asymmetric. So they're more circular, more uh, symmetric. And those are the type 1A remnants. Um, and then sitting up above in this region where our remnants will be more elliptical and more asymmetric, we have those blue ones. Um, and these are the core collapse remnants. And you can see on this plot, there really is quite a marked divide between the two groups. And so their morphologies are actually quite distinct. Um, so I've got some examples. So this one here is DEML71, so a type 1A remnant. You can see it's got this kind of circular ring and then the emission is quite uniform across it. And if you fold it in half, it would resemble itself quite well. Whereas this one here, you can see we've got quite bright emission down the bottom and less up the top. And it's kind of, you know, a weird, bean shaped morphology, so that's um, N132G, which is a known core collapse remnant. Um, and so when we're trying to understand the type of star that left a remnant behind, we can think about the, the morphology and use the fact that type 1A remnants are more circular and mirror symmetric uh, than core collapse remnants. And so I think at this point, I've um, included a poll that I think Christian has organized and so using the fact that type 1A remnants are more circular and mirror symmetric than core collapse remnants, um, kind of based on this information, uh, how would you classify the two remnants? Hopefully no one saw that. <laughs> how would you classify the two remnants uh, on the right? Yeah, I, so put, I, put, I put the poll up, so yes. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Is there a way that I can uh, see the responses, Christian? Or? You you can in a second. Uh, I will. I will. In a second. Uh, oh, once you close just, it. Okay. I'm just. Um, so we've got about forty five seconds so far. I'm just going to allow maybe twenty more seconds, okay? And then. Yeah. And no then worries. then you can comment on it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. This is an interesting question. It's good. see okay we have let's see how many one minute to, okay i'm going to end the poll and i'll share the results now you should be able to see them yes mm -hmm. nice okay <laughs> so we've kind of got a bit of a distribution but it looks like the majority have gone with d so where type one at one 
where number one is a type 1A and two is a core collapse. So sometimes it can be difficult, right? Because type, the first one here, it's like, it's quite circular, but it has kind of got all of these clumps going on and like a little bit of a protrusion coming out. So it can be kind of difficult, but if we really think about it, it is very circular and all of these clumps, they're kind of uniform throughout the object. And so this one, um, as many of you said correctly, um, is actually uh, a type 1A remnant. It's actually Tico's supernova remnant that I talked about previously. Um, and it's a very, very famous type 1A remnant. Um, and we know that because we have great observations of it with really good resolution and depth. And so we can see the iron emission really well. And that's really kind of a smoking gun and lets us know that it's a type 1A remnant. But also it has this morphology that's consistent uh, with the type 1A. Um, and then the second one, if we look at it, it's got a very kind of odd shape. There's maybe more emission to this side. It's not circular at all, I would say. So yeah, this one is um, N49, which is a well-known core collapse supernova. And so um, based on those classifications, that would make um, D the correct answer, as many of you, um, you know, voted for in the poll. Yeah, so I guess now, you kind of have this understanding of remnants, you can probably look at a lot of different ones and maybe have a guess at what would their classification would be to first order. So yes, okay, and now we're gonna get into the research kind of part of it and like what I work on at the moment, because um, now we're all on the same page, we all have a fabulous understanding of supernovae and their remnants. Um, so what do I work on? Well, I try to understand um, the small Magellanic cloud remnants using their morphologies. So um, for many of the small Magellanic cloud remnants, there are roughly 30 of them. We don't actually know what their origins are. So sometimes they haven't been observed um, with an X-ray telescope. Um, sometimes the observations are not good enough to really um, understand what the supernova type is. And so for this reason, I've been working on looking at all of their morphologies because you don't need as good of an observation for this because you really just need to be able to see the shape you don't need to observe for like a long time to get a good signal to noise and see the emission lines. You just need to be able to see what they look like. And so the motivation is to look at these remnants and using their morphologies, maybe get a better picture of the type of supernova that occurred um, from this method. And so what I've been doing with my supervisor is um, taking those Chandra observations um, for any that had available and archival observations. Um, and so this amounted to 15 remnants. And so I've got the observations here. And you can see we've really got quite a diversity of uh, remnants and morphologies. Um, some of them are quite symmetric, like this one here at the top left. This one, we can kind of see a ring structure, but we've also got, you know, some kind of weird clumpy objects, which are quite, a little bit strange. And maybe based on what you're seeing in these images, you would maybe have a guess at what most of these um, remnants are the result of, whether that be a type 1A or a core collapse supernova. Um, but basically we took our observations um, and then we extracted the soft X-ray emission. So from 0.5 to 2.1 keV. Um, and we just use this um, emission band because we tend to see a lot of emission at the lower energies. Um, and as well, that was what was studied in that kind of earlier study where they worked out um, that type 1A is the more circular and mirror symmetric. And so we just wanted to use kind of the same um, energy, energy range for consistency. And then using that power ratio method, we're able to quantify the ellipticity and the mirror asymmetry. Um, and so we can get a number that rep represents how elliptical the remnant is and also how mirror asymmetric it is. Um, and then, so doing that, we then get a plot here. So on the x-axis, we have um, the P3 power ratio, which I haven't gone into the math, but more towards this end of the plot, you're gonna see more asymmetric remnants. Um, and then on the y-axis, at the top end of the y-axis, you'll see like more elliptical remnants. Um, and so on this plot, the locations mark um, kind of the morphologies of our remnants and the marker indicates 
the supernova type that had been previously suggested using other means. Um, and so the squares indicates ones that we thought were maybe core collapse, um, while the star indicates the one that was maybe thought to be a type 1A. Um, however, these classifications were done based on like what information was available in the literature. And so for some of them, um, we were, very, we were very sure of what they are from previous studies. So that includes like 1E0102 down here or IKT21 or 23. So we know for sure what these are, but there are others that we don't know so well. Um, and so, yeah, these were just based off our best guess from previously published papers. Um, and so the first kind of important thing to note is that most of our remnants are sitting above this dashed line that kind of represents the boundary between um, core collapse morphologies above and type 1A morphologies below. Um, and yeah, so the first thing to note is that most of our remnants are lying in that core collapse region of the plot. Um, and this kind of makes sense because if we look at all of the markers, most of them were squares. So we were kind of expecting most of them to be core collapse anyway. Um, so that's like quite a good result. Um, so their morphologies tend to agree with what other people have said in the literature. Um, however, the kind, there are two that are maybe somewhat um, concerning or somewhat interesting. And the first one is this HFPK334 just here um, indicated with the star. So that one was previously suggested to possibly be a type 1A. Um, and this was done based on really the surrounding environment. So it was found to be in a less dense environment. There weren't many other stars around. Um, and so based off that, um, it was actually my supervisor in one of her papers, she suggested it might be a type 1A. But really, the environment can give us a hint, but it's not a smoking gun. And so it's actually probably a better kind of classification now using the morphology, um, which is usually a better classifier than environment, but not as good as the X-ray spectrum. But yeah, this one is probably more likely to be a um, core collapse remnant. And then the other one of concern maybe is this one EO102 down here, which is a very well-known core collapse remnant and is in fact the calibration source for Chandra, um, but for some reason is very, very symmetric and lies within this type 1A region of the plot. Um, and so should we be concerned? So as I said, the HFPK334, probably not, um, because the morphology is probably actually a better indicator of its type, and it's maybe actually more likely to be a core collapse remnant. Um, and what about for 1E0102? Well, for this one, it's maybe a little bit more concerning because it is known to be a core collapse remnant. We observed it a lot and we have very deep X-ray observations. So we see the X-ray spectrum that we would expect from a core collapse supernova remnant. Um, and so really then the question is, why does this core collapse remnant have such symmetric X-ray emission that would be consistent with a type 1A remnant? Well. Maybe it's something to do with the environment it's found in. Maybe the environment, um, there's not much going on, which has allowed it to evolve in a symmetric way. Or also maybe if you think of a water bottle, um, if you look at the water bottle from the end, it's going to look like a circle, right? But if you turned it on the side, you'd see that it was quite elliptical and extended. So maybe it has something to do with our viewing angle. But we're kind of delving into this a bit more now, but this one is quite perplexing, actually. Um, and then following that classification, what we've done is compared the morphologies of the remnants in the small Magellanic Cloud to those in the large Magellanic Cloud and the Milky Way. Um, so on this plot, um, we have, again, on the x-axis, that kind of quantifier of mirror asymmetry with more asymmetric remnants um, towards the higher end. And then on the y-axis, again, we have ellipticity. And so for this plot, we have in like this greeny color, um, the small Magellanic Cloud remnants. Um, in the blue here, we have the large Magellanic Cloud remnants. And then in pink, um, we have those Milky Way remnants. And what we can see is that these um, green remnants are more towards the top right than first like the blue remnants and then the pink. And so we can see that those small Magellanic Cloud remnants are even more elliptical and more asymmetric than those in the large Magellanic Cloud and the Milky Way. And so why might this be the case? Well, what is one of the main differences between these galaxies? Well, 
astronomers love to talk about met metallicity um, and this could really have an effect on um, the asymmetries that we're seeing in our remnants. And so when we talk about metallicity as astronomers, um, we're not really talking about metals, we're talking about how much of a star is not hydrogen or helium. So how much of it is every other element in the periodic table? Um, and why have I included this square jar image on this plot? Um, well, because in our office, we don't have a square jar, we have a calling oxygen a metal jar, which is a lame astronomy joke, but I don't know, kind of, kind of fun. So we had that above our fridge for a while and there were some coins that built up over time. Um, and so, yeah, that's what metallicity is. Anything that's not hydrogen um, and that's not helium. And so what is um, important about metallicity? Well, it can influence um, mass loss and rotation of stars. So how they kind of blow off material as they're dying um, and how they spin around on their axis. Um, and it's known that these two um, processes could really affect to quite a large extent the evolution of stars. And so if these two um, processes are occurring in different ways, you might expect to see different remnants um, as well. Um, and as well, bipolar or jet-driven explosions are more frequent in low density and low metallicity environments, um, where a bipolar or a jet-driven explosion is one that kind of proceeds on two axes. And so that would kind of um, lead to a more elliptical remnant. Um, and as well, other studies have suggested that low metallicity is expected to cause more asymmetric remnants. And so it's very likely that that's what we're seeing in this plot because the SMC has the lowest metallicity and it's got the most asymmetric remnants. And then in the middle, with the kind of middle metallicity, we have um, some blue Large Magellanic Cloud remnants and then the pink remnants tend to be the least asymmetric and the least elliptical. Um, and the Milky Way remnants, um, they'll have the lowest metallicity because the Milky Way has quite a low metallicity. Um, yeah, and so that's quite an interesting result. So it seems that this um, low metallicity environment does indeed produce more asymmetric remnants. Um, and then just to summarize, so not only do supernova remnants look good, um, they also encode information on how the stars died. And so if we observe them at a variety of wavelengths, we can piece together these um, bits of information, kind of understand how that star lived and how it died. Um, and then as well, um, massive stars, they die as core collapse supernovae um, and they create less symmetric remnants, um, while low mass stars that become white dwarfs and then find a partner and then become a type 1a supernova, um, leave more symmetric remnants. And then as well, we've finally seen that uh, low metallicity creates more asymmetric remnants. Um, and then to end, I'll just leave you with this art that I love including in my talk. So it's by David Trigley and it's um, clouds of gas, enjoy them before they disperse. And so that's what I've been doing for my PhD for the past years and I'll do for the next year and a bit before I finish. So, thanks.